What is up, guys? Welcome back to the Guestless Podcast. Excited for this conversation. I'm sitting here with Rachel Matthew. She is the co-owner of Polston Tax. She's also quite a decorated woman as well. She's an attorney, accountant, author, public speaker. And when I was going through her profile, she has like 20 to 30 different accolades and awards for the things that she've done, she's done throughout her career. So I'm honored to have Rachel on and thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I love listening to your podcast. I love all the interviews you've had to do. It's been a, it's a real wide expanse of people you had the opportunity to talk to and they're all so interesting. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, as we were discussing before this, you know, Vegas is a very growing town. It's filled by tourism, but now there's so many different people that are coming out here. There's a need for knowledge of all these emerging industries. And uh, that's why I'm fortunate to have you on here as well. Also, we were discussing before this, like there's so many different tax implications that are covering into the city, wh whether it's the strip and t uh, tip compliance or the emerging cannabis industry, which I've saw that's listed on your site. Like there's so many different fine tune and niche tax laws and regulations. It's, it's really, really terrifying. So um, before we get into that, let's just start with, with your background. Um, you know, just give us a description of, you know, who Rachel Matthew is, um, how, where you grew up and um, just kind of like your mindset. Yeah, I, so I originally am from a suburb of Detroit and uh, grew up hating the cold, hating shoveling snow, and cried every winter when I had to do it, and uh, was always looking to move south. And so I am a fan of warm weather and all things sunshine related. Uh, I was an accountant before I decided to go to law school, and honestly, I had never, I was never one of those people who had this lifelong vision of becoming an attorney. I'll, I'll say everybody I went to law school with, not everybody, but the vast majority, that was their goal. That was the plan since they were a kid. And I, I thought attorneys were arrogant and pretentious and jerks and just all these things that I didn't envision for myself as like the life goal. <laughs> so uh, really why I decided to go to law school, and I should say all those things, you don't have to be all those things if you're an attorney. There are those attorneys, though. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be uh, that way. Um, but when I was an accountant, I saw, um, I don't know why I didn't realize it till I was working as an accountant, but the government is just set up against businesses. And I had always had an entrepreneurial spirit. I had always wanted to be a business owner. It's, kind of, it's where my heart is. My dad had always been a business owner and juggled multiple businesses. So I, and um, he, my parents were immigrants from India. They came in the seventies when in America, there's always been a hospital shortage. My mom's a nurse. So they came to Detroit to, for my mom to be a nurse at a hospital in Detroit. But I kind of grew up seeing my dad struggle with businesses and just, and wrongly thought, oh, it's because he's an immigrant and he has trouble with the culture and the language and all those things, only to become an accountant and realize like, no, the whole system is screwed up for everybody. It's not, it wasn't a language barrier. It's not like not knowing the culture or business in America. It is that our system is stacked against self-employed people and the business community and the government doesn't help. They just audit and take people's money and, um, don't tell people the rules and until they break them. So that's really what made me decide to go to law school. I wanted to be a tax defense attorney and represent business owners, self-employed people against the government. And uh, yeah, make arguments about why business owners should be protected. I, I love that route that you're going. That was actually going to be leading into my next question was like, do you, do you do it because you like the outcomes, you like defending people? Is it kind of like more of the mentality of, oh, I want to stick it to the man because they just constantly screw people over and they're just after money and like they don't, the thing with the government and the IRS specifically is like they, they don't put faces to the names. All they see is a name and a number and they're like, all right, I'm coming after it. And they don't realize like, you know, if they, they send out some sort of error in their IRS audit and this person's working like a minimum wage job, but they have like a $10,000 audit, they like, they don't understand like anything that goes behind it. But, but in your position, you do because you're down with the clients and you know, you're like, I really want to help you. 
Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So it's so funny you said it like that because we actually made a sign in our office, just a handwritten sign that says every case has a face. And it's important to us because we, we do, we have clients from all over the nation and we represent clients in tax court before the IRS all over the nation. And you get the impression when working with the IRS, not only do they not know what their own rules say, but they don't care. They don't care about, they just have too much work to do and then too many taxpayers to talk to. And it's, it is more of a number. And not only that, I, um, a few years ago, let's see. So all around the country, there are these IRS service centers, which are just like their main hubs to like just get mail and distribute mail and all of that. So I went to one of their main hubs, which was in Kansas city, Missouri. And I was pretty excited. It was like, for the, re the central region of the country. It's the main IRS hub. And I wanted to see what the operation was like. They were gonna give us a behind the scenes tour of the facility and the operations. And I don't know why they did it because it's horrific. It, the mail you send to the IRS comes in on these you know, huge plastic, um, I mean, just monster plastic. I, I think of them as like those garbage bins Oh, and gosh. on wheels that they wheel in and people pick the mail out by mail a person opens each envelope by mail i mean you can imagine there's hundred thousand dollar checks in there there's handwritten letters there's receipts there's i mean all sorts of things that people are mailing and they get lost all the time i represent clients all the time and see the irs lose things forget to process something cash the check but not saying they didn't get the tax return i mean on and on and on <laughs> Um, the tour, needless to say, it was horrific. I, um, understand that the IRS doesn't have, they have their budget slashed year after year after year by Congress, which is stupid by in and of itself. It's like, you don't have the money. So you're going to cut off the arms of the people that get money. <laughs> but so then they just don't have technology. They are, uh, the, I, I don't want to put down the individuals who work at the IRS, frankly, I have good relationships with some of them, but they, uh, there's a lot to be desired in not just the working environment, but how things are done. I mean, from each page being hand stamped by somebody by hand, that's their job. Next page, next page. I mean, that's, you can only imagine how many mistakes they're making every day over there. Yeah, it's, it sounds like the IRS and the government typically is one of the last movers in terms of like technological innovation. So, you know, you're sitting there stamping and uh, looking like it's like a 1970s shop that hasn't changed in over 50 years. So I can completely see what's going on behind that. And then when you stack up people who are doing work by, by manual labor and they're probably processing, you know, 100 different um, individuals or business applications at a time you just kind of lose touch of, of what reality is and, right yeah and, no and you were asking about if I like making the arguments sticking it to the man uh, I, I will say you know to the point about every case has a face they do they all have stories they're all real people and like right now I have a case where a client one of the things that happens with the IRS that especially frustrates me is the penalties and interest accrue and snowball on whatever taxes are owed. So I have a client right now whose taxes, penalties, interest is $1.982 million, which is, sounds like an Jesus. enormous number, <laughs> but a good chunk of it is based on an error the IRS won't correct. And then penalties and interest. And there's a technicality on why we can't get that corrected due to statute of limitations on those expenses not being provided within the window to for a reconsideration anyway. So taxes that we can't get corrected, then penalties and interest on top of that. And this individual is in the hospitality industry, which good or bad, I mean, his industry is tanked this year. And just this week, uh, so we've been negotiating on this case for two years now with the IRS on, honestly, his, his specific business had, one of the reasons that there was a bookkeeping error was because there was a lack of funding to pay the right person to do it correctly. I mean, that happens time and time again. So his business was already not doing great when he ended up with this tax mess. And then we've been negotiating on what to settle on as, 
as an accurate amount that he should pay. So 1.982 million, and this week the IRS said that they would agree to 389,000, which the client is like, well, I don't exactly have 389,000 sitting around, but I can figure that one out over the next couple months and we can do a payment, which was just, that's the right, that's closer to what it should be. And that's what I like to see happen is getting it right for the taxpayer. That's, that sounds exactly right. So from my understanding, I guess, from, from the conversation we had so far, uh, when you hire a tax attorney representing you, um, it helps put a, put a face to all of those applications in terms of the IRS, right? Like if you're just somebody who's just sending mail in um, because you got an audit and you're like, here's all my information, like it's just another stack on, on the paper pile. But if you're in there representing it, then there's more direct lines of communications and there's more, I guess you'd say more creative, constructive conversation between you and um, whoever. Here, actually, this is my question. When you're back there negotiating with people, is it, are you assigned to one specific IRS agent? Is there like a courtroom structure back there? Like what's that kind of process when you're representing someone? Yeah, so I'll answer sort of both of those parts, like with hiring a tax attorney and what that structure's like. So one thing that, I would really warn people about is the structure is different. And the reason I say I would warn people is you don't want to hire somebody who also does tax law. Tax law is not something you want to sort of dabble in. It doesn't have a judge watching over it to make sure it's moving forward. It's not on a docket. It's not in the court. That's just like, it has to move forward and someone's keeping an eye on it. You could have an attorney not work on it and the IRS is going to just, you're going to keep moving forward in the IRS's collections process. And for the vast majority of the cases, it's going forward in collections and you need someone who knows which, you know, levers to pull and what strings are appropriate at the different times. So I'll use this, the case I just referenced. That client came to us because he had a large balance there's a, a threshold that the irs actually assigns your case your tax liability to an individual local irs revenue officer so a revenue officer is someone assigned to investigate you figure out your financial situation figure out your ability to pay um, and determine and, and make decisions on what you can afford how you can pay this back and so we were assigned to a local revenue officer who swore that the client was lying. And it was, and that is one of the problems with revenue officers. If they, they have encountered a, a number of tax evaders and they just start to get jaded that everyone's trying to evade taxes. So you have to have, I would say, an advocate who is able to prove you're, this person's not hiding anything. They're not trying to get away with something. They legitimately can't. Here's the real reason why they didn't pay. And here's, why they can't afford to pay it right now and let's figure out a solution and here are the solutions that are allowed by law so in that case they had this revenue officer we went round and round with the revenue officer and until we exhausted him and the revenue officer agreed with us that an offer and compromise settlement would be the best option that piece of it by itself took gosh several months if not almost a year to for him to, because the revenue officer also can get the offer and compromise denied before it even starts to get processed just by saying, this is an action to avoid collections. So they, they have to sort of sign off that they've investigated it and they agree. Well, in the in-between time between the revenue officer uh, approving it and being okay with it and then us getting to file the offer, the IRS had moved the case forward in collections and they were going to seize this taxpayers' assets. So that's something that you hear about. Sometimes it sounds like it's maybe a scare tactic, but it's real. You know, we had a client who was, gosh, 70 some, in her 70s and no income. Her, her house was paid off by her husband who had passed away. She was a widow. She didn't work. And all she had was this house she lives in. And she had his social security death benefits. And the IRS moved to seize the house because he owed taxes from the income he had earned passed away and now here was the only asset, joint asset in their names. And so they moved to seize the house, which was, which is why she hired us. But that was one of the most heartbreaking cases to see. I mean, we see the IRS seize assets all the time, sometimes without warning. Uh, 
and in this case with this rev this individual with the revenue officer in the hospitality industry who we were going to file an offer on the irs moved forward to seize assets so we had to quickly file for an appeal hearing in the appeal hearing they we couldn't reach an agreement but that got, got us enough time to be able to file the offer and compromise so that put it into a hold the problem that we encountered was that in the offer and compromise the irs typically will reject a lot of those so they rejected it we appealed it they rejected it we appealed it and finally it went to another level appeals officer who again rejected it and we we went around with him about four times until this week when he said okay here's what i'll agree to and i and we have to convince them it's in the best interest of the government you know on the one hand the real argument the whole time was it's in the best interest of the government to get this almost two million dollars <laughs> and we have to convince them it's in the best interest of the government to accept something less and what we were pushing for was actually lower than the 389 we settled on we you know that's you have to have strategy and in, in how you pursue those negotiations so at different points you get assigned to different people um but below certain thresholds you're just talking to the irs at large it's the same a different person in a different part of the country every time what what is that threshold let's say like i wanted to approach you and i got we'll just throw out a number $2,500 audit from we'll say unreported tips because that's pretty related to Vegas. Yeah. Is that something that would require a tax attorney or would you be better off just kind of fighting it on your own? Yeah, I would say, you know, it's a good, that's a good question on threshold. If you get a revenue officer assigned, it will be for one of two reasons. You either owe personal taxes on your 1040 tax return of over $250,000, then you'll get a personal local revenue officer assigned. Or if you owe any kind of business income, you'll have a revenue officer assigned. Um, in terms of who, at what level do you need to hire a tax attorney? It's funny you ask that because that's a question we've had in our own office for, many years we have even talked about it recently to say at what point does it make this is what i'll say because because it's an ongoing conversation because it's different for each person for some people i've had clients who owe twelve thousand dollars and i've explained to them in the consultation it might not make sense for you to hire us because here's here's the things that you could just do on your own without hiring me and you're going to end up just paying more money to me and then paying the twelve thousand dollars too and I use that example because that client hired me anyway, because he said, I don't want to deal with the IRS. I would rather end up paying the $12,000 and have you deal with the IRS because I don't even know what I'm doing, even though you just explained it to me. So that's exactly the reason why I can't, we can't ever, I can spell it out to somebody. And that's not the only case where somebody said, I understand I may end up even paying you more, but I don't want to deal with the IRS and I just feel like they're going to take advantage of me, which not that, that could happen. You know, I wouldn't recommend anyone handle their own audit. That's one thing I would not tell anyone to handle their own audit. Um, if you have a balance due, if you owe maybe under $25,000, there are some easy things you could get set up by yourself that I would say you probably don't need a tax attorney um and that's twenty five thousand dollars if you're not going to owe on any other year or if there's any no other outstanding issues yeah so it's, it's a culmination and from what i've seen through through friends and people that work in vegas once the irs has you on their radar they tend to come after you multiple times in a row and i've kind of heard a myth and i'd like for you to, to tell me if this is true or not what is the what is the length of time where the IRS can go back and peer into your old tax returns? And is there a limit for the amount of times that they could audit you in a row? Okay, those are both great questions. And you're right, there's a lot of myths about it. Okay, and this is actually why the other case I was talking about, we couldn't make changes. So there is a statute of limitations on your ability to amend a tax return and the IRS's ability to open a tax return that you have filed. And it's three years from, either, from your filing date, really, from either the filing deadline date, so April 15th or October 15th if you filed an extension, or three years from when you filed. So somebody today could be filing a 2016 tax return that they never filed. 
Well, from when they file it now in 2020, even though it's crazy late, the IRS actually gets three more years to try to audit that returns. So uh, let's use 2021. We're going to be filing our 2020 tax return. And let's we'll say you file an extension, you get to file it October 15, 2021. Well, then the IRS has three years from that date to audit your 2020 tax return. So 2022, 2023, 2024, by October 14th of 2024, they could open, send you a letter saying we're examining your 2020 tax return. And then if they do make a change to the tax return, they're able to audit if there's some kind of change, either one way or the other, meaning they owe you money or you owe them money, which it'll probably be you owe them money. <laughs> <laughs> but if they find that they, that they make a change to the tax return, then they can open up two consecutive years, either before or after that tax return. And usually they'll go backward because they're outside the statute of limitations backward, but for the fact that they made this change to your tax return. So that kind of opens up two more back years. So you could be in the year 2024, having that audit go on for two years, let's say it's 2026 now, and the audit finishes and you get, they make a change and you owe money, they actually can open the 18 and 19 return as well because they made a change to your 2020 return. So you could be like in 2026, having to argue over your 2018, 2019 return. Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes, it makes complete sense. Yeah, that's a, lo a lot of people um, in the industry that I've worked in, they always, get audited it seems to be three years in a row seems to be kind of like what the limit happens and then they seem to hold off for a second yeah so exactly so they can audit two consecutive years if they make a change to one year and they'll usually end up going backwards so that's how you get those three years in a row mm -hmm. is they'll open those once they make a change once they find one change to make to one return they can open two others and it can happen pretty quickly and then after that they can actually audit repeatedly i had another case where a client um uh, okay, this client, he, his wife didn't work, husband worked, he earned all this income, he didn't pay any income tax on it, and he paid state taxes, which is actually problematic because he had a state license he had to keep renewed, so he paid his state taxes, didn't pay federal, and the fact that he was paying his state taxes meant he was knowingly evading, potentially, his federal taxes, because he's knowingly filing his state, and um, so he got audited, those three years, then that audit, he owed several hundred thousand dollars from that, plus penal including penalties and interest, then got audited again three more years, plus penalties and interest on that, and then got audited again three more years. So he hadn't filed in any of those tax returns. So when I say audit, the IRS ended up preparing the returns for him. He, another one where he ended up owing, he, this was so memorable because he ended up owing over a million dollars and his wife had no idea. She had no idea that returns hadn't been filed, had no idea um, that they were audited and had no idea they owed all this money. And I had met her at a Kinko's after he had retained us to have her sign some returns, married filing separately so that she wouldn't be liable for those last three years, which was when he hired us. And she met me at Kinko's to sign the returns. It was, I, I, I met her there because she was, it was like her daughter's prom day, prom night, and they were getting their nails done or something. And uh, so she met me there, signed the returns and said, okay, well, is that it? Are we done? And I said, well, I mean, you know, you owe these like over a million dollars total, your husband does in all these years. And the prior six years had been filed married filing jointly, but she didn't know. And she doesn't even remember signing the returns. And about a week or so later, she found out her husband had, her husband and her found out he had end stage cancer. And then he passed away just that quickly. And now she owes all these taxes that she didn't know about. Uh, that one actually, we were able to get innocent spouse relief approved. I'll, I will never forget that case because the IRS agreed to forgive the whole thing. And um, she hadn't signed the returns. I was able to prove that the signature had been forged on the prior years. and. Uh, that was a mess that, I mean, they're never, it, they're never quick solutions. That took about three years or so before we finally were able to put that behind her. So, so there are some special cases where they will take certain um, things that happen in somebody's life, certain scenarios. So that is at least a good sign. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I would say that's, 
that would be the number one reason you would want to hire a tax attorney. If you feel like you have some really good specific reasons that you didn't pay the tax, couldn't pay the tax, maybe your industry's changed. We had a bunch of people hire us when um, the Affordable Care Act passed and it changed, it like cut commissions for the people in that industry. Uh, those are the types of specific things you need someone to argue because the IRS is going to say, no, you just pay us the taxes. <laughs> So when, if you, let's say you, you argue for your clients and you create some sort of like payment plan structure for them, um, if it's something that's longer than, let's say, I think the general rates, like they give you like four months to pay for it or something like that. Um, if you have to do a prolonged payment period, do they add on additional interest and money because you have to take so long to pay it? Yes. So your penalties and interest continue to accrue. Even if you hire a tax attorney, even if you um, got a collection hold, your penalties and interest accrue every single day, actually. And if you owe taxes, the IRS sends a letter and there's line by line how much, what the interest rate was day by every single day from this date to this date. This was the interest rate. This is how much we added. Penalties and interest accrue every single day, even if you're in a payment plan. Um, you mentioned that there's four month payment plans. There, that I, that there's actually a wide range of payment agreements the IRS will um, agree to. And that, that actually kind of brings up a good point. So if you yourself were to call the IRS, they may say, hey, all we can do is four months, um, which actually makes me laugh because they, right off the bat, they are, can do 60 months. I mean, that's an easy one that I wouldn't even have to really argue. They could do 60 months, they could do 72 months, they can do 80 months. Um, your entire statute of limitations is 120 months from when the balance is first created. Wow. So they really won't go outside of 120 months, but um, you don't necessarily even have to pay your total taxes, your penalties and interest. And you don't even have to pay the whole balance over that 120 months if you did that. That's another agreement. Like I have some clients who are on fixed incomes and they, like they might have a house that they don't want to borrow against that's paid off that instead we could just get them into like a partial pay agreement. They just pay the same amount until the, until the statute of limitations runs out 120 months and they're done. They don't owe the rest. And, and in terms of your business pulse and tax, um, I was reading on your profile that when you came in, there was three employees and then you've grown it to over a hundred employees and you know, you're, uh, you're actually stationed out in Oklahoma, but on your website, it says nationwide. So when now, and that is something I preach on the podcast all the time is how everything's becoming remote, uh, businesses have to scale and be borderless. Um, is there a different process when you're representing different clients in different states based off of like the state jurisdictions and regulations? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, so one thing that's that I love about tax law is that they make it a court of convenience. So there's instances. So so for example, on that appeals officer case I talked about and said, you know, we did we just reached an agreement. Really, if I didn't reach an agreement with him, the next stage could have been I could have filed a petition to tax court. Or if the, if the IRS audits you and you, they send you their assessment, you can petition that to tax court. And so tax court is in each state. They have, in Oklahoma, they have one, one location. Um, and in each state they have, it depends on the size of the population and the size of the state, but they'll have sometimes multiple locations. But tax court is different than any other kind of court in that earlier I said, you don't, your entire case doesn't get assigned to a docket and a judge is overseeing it and moving it forward until you petition tax court. So if you petition, if you have the right to petition tax court, which you don't in every case, it's just like very limited instances when you can even go to tax court. And even when you go, the judge may not decide if you're right or wrong. You may just decide, you may only be able to say this was procedurally wrong and then get it sent back for them to evaluate it again. But tax court judges are all located in Washington, D.C. They're all located in Washington, D.C. And they have a docket where they come to the different cities around the nation twice a year. So there's tax court in every single state or every single location twice a year. And we sort of say it's the fall and the spring in Oklahoma. But if I have a client in Vegas, I actually can file for 
the court of convenience and I can say it's in Oklahoma or I can say it's in Vegas and I can I can pick whichever docket I want not I can't really pick because it takes about two years to get on the docket but I can pick where I want it to be so um, even if a client is in Vegas tax court is federal law so it just it's blanket law that applies no matter where you're situated in the country uh, local state law doesn't doesn't it federal law is going to trump it and um, I can uh, the judge will hear the case no matter where I file for it to be heard and it's going to end up being the same anywhere in the country but what you were saying about how things have been changing we are the first office we opened was in Oklahoma was in Norman Oklahoma so my business partner his name is Rod Polston hence Polston Tax <laughs> and um, yeah I joined him and we had it was him a receptionist a case manager and an accountant and, and a, a part-time intern and he like me he doesn't really like attorneys and didn't want to hire me uh i i can't say I, I begged him for my job but i convinced him that i had uh wanted to add value and just had a bigger vision for i thought he was the best tax attorney in the state and that's what i wanted to do and so now we have about 120 employees in six states but several years ago gosh probably 2016 i uh, no, it was before 2016 because we opened um, a Kansas office. We had opened a Tulsa office, Oklahoma City office, and an Edmond office, Yukon office. So a couple different offices around the state. And I started to realize we didn't necessarily even need to go in person. By about 2015, I was I personally was video chatting with clients and um, doing a lot of seminars online. and spoken, I don't know how many hundreds of times, how many tens of thousands of people and just started to think about how we could get away from being a brick and mortar law firm tax firm accounting firm and what that could look like for helping clients everywhere instead of just a phone conference what could that look like so in 2016 we started opening some offices in kansas i would still go to kansas it was still close enough but then we started to find that we could just have Zoom meetings with clients in Kansas City and they could go to the office and, or we could, they could either go to the office and our team there could, you could set them up on the Zoom or they could just have a Zoom meeting with us from anywhere and we'd send them the link. And so that was great. And now with COVID, uh, I, I had referenced that we've been getting clients from all over the nation everybody is using zoom so <laughs> before we were i mean i wish when we had started using zoom to see how it would work i wish i wish i mean how many people are saying this i wish i'd invested in zoom technology stock so true <laughs> yeah but uh, honestly then and i know how we felt then i thought all right i mean i know that this could work but is the public ready? You know, is the business owner ready to not meet with an attorney in person, not meet with someone, sit down face to face, look them in the face and judge, you know, how much they trust them and like them. And so it was a little, it was it, touch and go in my opinion then. And now it's, people don't care. They need to have their problem fixed. They might have their assets being seized, their bank account wiped out and they don't need to come into a conference room with me. They're happy to just, have a Zoom meeting and figure out how we can help. Yeah, truly a pioneer. You set yourself up for this exact situation. COVID kind of just accelerates a lot of trends that are that are moving forward. And I actually had no idea what Zoom was until about like April anyways. So I agree with you on that. But it is becoming more uh, adaptable in today's society. Everyone's using FaceTime, Zoom conferences. And um, even to talk to a lawyer, it seems so much easier, especially just going through my own experiences with setting up uh, meetings with lawyers and different business people, there's always like a long waiting list where it's like, oh, you can't come to the office for four months because you're booked with conferences. But if you do something remote, it literally only takes a few days to a week because you could take more clients on in one day. Yeah. And you know, I, I have always thought, I mean, I'm, I have the regular business hours anyone has Monday through Friday. And I, always, I think about this all the time, you know, I, I mean, frankly, we are busy clients come in and they're business owners they're self-employed individuals and i do always think they're taking time away from their business and their ability to make money to drive to our location 
to take, carve that time out to sit in the consultation and then however long that's going to take. And that what a hassle that is, frankly, for every single one of our clients to have to like stop the day. And most of them aren't in a position to even get away. You know, our, our clients, they're not coming in the day after they owe taxes. It's usually years and years after they owe taxes, they're finally facing real action from the IRS and having to say, all right, I gotta, I gotta make time. I'm about to lose my house. So I'll figure this out. <laughs> and, uh, but I wanted it to be easier for clients. I mean, that, that's their livelihood. And how can we make this easier? I mean, outside of just us taking night appointments, <laughs> How can we make this easier and still be able to explain their options, you know, just as easily as them picking up their phone and having a meeting right there in their business place? Yeah, I have to say it's a, it's a little bit less nerve wracking to talk to somebody through a computer than it is in person, because anytime you have to get a, a, an attorney involved, then it means that you're in some sort of turmoil with your life and, you know, like you're fending off for your assets getting seized or you're going bankrupt or whatever the case is for whatever attorney. So when you're in the office, sometimes you find yourself like, high anxiety, trembling, because you're like, God, please save me. But once you're talking through a computer, you're in your own home, you feel more safe and you feel a little bit more open to what you can explain. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would say I, the piece that I didn't expect, you know, I joked earlier about how arrogant and pretentious attorneys are, and I really shouldn't make that joke anymore because what I didn't expect, I didn't foresee that now I now see is that Man, when people hire an attorney, that is usually the most stressful point of their life. And I've lost count of the number of people that have not just broken down and started crying, but have said, I, nobody knows, nobody knows that I owe taxes. My business partner doesn't know. I was just talking to a client yesterday who has two business partners and he hasn't told them. And we're pretty far into his audit and he's the majority owner but I was talking to him about how he has to tell his business partners because they're going to end up getting it's it's the assessment is going to flow through to the business partners tax returns. And even if he's the majority owner with the right to represent them uh, solely they they have to know. And um, it, it counselor is, is such an appropriate term because it's almost like, um, I don't want to say it's like confessional, but it's, it's people just carry this weight uh, until they finally break down and try to get some help. And that uh, I am so thankful that I get to do this kind of work. It's so rewarding. I could see that. And when you're representing clients on a business behalf, does the IRS view a business audit and let's say an individual audit exactly the same, or is there a separation in the divisions? Yeah, it, there's a separation. So a some auditors will will handle. So the IRS is divided up by what their personnel can take on. So a revenue officer, a more senior experienced revenue officer will take on more complex business cases, for example, whereas maybe a more junior revenue officer may get assigned a smaller personal individual 1040 balance. Um, same thing with the IRS. Uh, offer department business offers versus or offers on business liabilities where they want to investigate the business. Actually, I'll tell you one funny story. I had a client who uh, had hired our office. You know, sometimes clients don't tell you the t whole truth, right? So had hired our office. We were in the middle of an offer, local offer. It was a business liability. So a local offer specialist was assigned and I had told the client the offer specialists will investigate your business. Well, in the negotiations, we were saying, well, the pizza, the pizza business is shut down. They're not making any money. And so there's no income. The offer specialist drives to the pizza business and finds out it's only cash. They only accept cash. So she buys a pizza and sends me the receipt. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And and denied our offer and I really couldn't get that one reopened because I got a payment plan set up but the IRS doesn't take kindly on uh you not telling them the truth <laughs> oh, wow I didn't even realize that they would leave and lay, lay some groundwork down and do that kind of an investigation yes, they do they will do a local investigation that when I say they assign a local revenue officer um 
man, I could, we could spend the whole time talking about stories. I have had revenue officers sit outside clients' houses. And then when we've had a trust fund interview with the revenue officer and my client, and I'm sitting right there too, the revenue officer will say, well, does your girlfriend know about that blonde that slept over last night? And oh like, no. Okay. And I, I said, okay, I object and we're going to, I'm going to take my client outside. And I took him in the hallway and said, that has not, that has nothing to do with your tax liability. I don't care if he, I don't care who was at your house last night. I don't care if the revenue officer sat outside your house last night. He was trying to psychologically get into your head and make you worried about this trust fund interview. It's exactly what I described and he's gonna ask you questions about the business. So just take a deep breath. And the revenue officers do that type of thing. They will stalk your client, uh, call, get cell phone, their cell phone records and call at random and say, they can't say you owe taxes, but I think it's enough to say, hi, I'm, you know, revenue officer so-and-so, just calling to find out how you know so-and-so or oh, knock on neighbor's God. doors and things like that. And, and when they're, let's say, when they're auditing a, a business, is there specific, I guess, ways of, or I guess, avenues of tax evasion that they look into? Yeah. So you asked if there's a difference between an audit for a personal and an audit for a business. So an audit for a personal, the IRS is typically, I would say for both baseline, the IRS is trying to, they're not trying to determine the accuracy of your tax return. That's the myth that I'm going to dispel that I thought, I thought that's what the audit was for to determine if your tax return was accurate. It's not, it's to, they, they're going to, Actually, I'll give you a statistic. The IRS typically audits lower income households at a personal level and um, businesses that earn under, so personal households that earn, that are low income to a million dollars is who's gonna get a personal audit. And then businesses that gross up to, I think it's 10 million or less. And so you may ask why would they, why would they audit what would be the less sophisticated people that may not be getting away with, you know, mm -hmm. big dollar tax sheltering. Um, and the reason is, is because the audit is to try to see if you can't prove your expenses. And if you can't on the personal or business, those expenses you deducted are automatically moved over to income. And then you automatically owe taxes plus penalties plus interest that has accrued since you filed that tax return to the date forward that it's assessed. So the goal really, and when I said earlier, you know, they're gonna make some change. Usually it's that you owe, not that you don't owe. The goal is to figure out who's taking deductions on their tax returns that we can push them to prove. Maybe it's, you took per, on the personal side. One thing people, one thing they um, will audit a lot is healthcare deduction. Prove every single dollar you claim done here is a medical expense. Oh, you don't have a receipt? too bad if you can't prove it it's income and then you owe taxes on it and then same thing with the business uh and i could i mean that there's a wide variety of things they're going to ask you to prove on the business side but it just keep good records of everything you're claiming because like we talked about earlier on the timeline don't hope that the receipt's still going to be intact six seven years from now when they could reopen that up you know make a copy scan it in and have it electronically saved if you get audited so you can prove it. Yeah, that's that's kind of why I use credit cards and, and uh, debit cards because you have that statement there in case anything ever happens, by God, I'll need you get put in this weird situation. But is it, this is something that I know causes a lot of concern for people and I'd hope you clear this, clarify this. Is the IRS able to get access to your bank statements without going through you? Are they able to send like a request into a bank and get all of those documents? They, they can, they will go through you first. So if the, the cheaper option for the IRS is to demand that you provide it to them. Um, but if you don't, they absolutely can move it forward, move it to the DOJ as an easy way and subpoena the bank and get the records. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's what I figured. I know a lot of people that causes concern. So like, oh my God, they're peering into my life. Is it an invasion of privacy? Like there's all kinds of different things. And so that, that does make a lot of sense to it. Yeah. I would say, especially with an audit, you, 
not only want to cooperate, but um, one thing you, I would advise is if the IRS is looking into one thing and it's, you know, something small, mortgage interest, you, you know, how much was the mortgage interest? Just instead of worrying about them looking at a million things, if you just quickly cooperate and quickly prove this one thing that they're looking at, you could probably squash the whole audit altogether. But the more evasive you seem to be to the IRS or less willing to cooperate, the more they're probably going to start to dig a little more to see what, what you are hiding or if there is something they should be like something else they should be looking at. Makes sense. So outside of the audit process, is there any other reason to hire a tax attorney or somebody that works in your business? Oh gosh, there's so many reasons. (laughs) Um, We, so outside of an audit, audit definitely number one. If you owe taxes, the majority of our clients owe taxes and they can't pay the balance back. And you know, every business owner is juggling, you know, what's coming in and what's going out. And so it's no surprise. I mean, I'm a business owner, we're juggling what's coming in and what's going out. It's no surprise that some people say, this year especially, <laughs> I'm putting the taxes off. I'm not gonna pay them. You know, in uh the summer, the president signed that executive order that people don't have to pay their uh, pay, part of their payroll taxes. Well, a lot of people put a pause on their payroll taxes, but they're still due next year. So all those business owners, all the self-employed people have to be ready to double up on those taxes. And it's an easy problem to get into. It's the number one reason that um, people really hire us. And I would hire a tax attorney if you can't pay it back to try to get out of the penalties that have accrued. That's That can be thousands of dollars um, to try to reach a settlement if it applies, to try to do a partial payment, even if it's a payment agreement, um, maybe to get a hardship approved instead of the IRS. Sometimes it can be as simple as, I legitimately cannot pay right now. I don't have income coming in right now. You know, hospitality industry or, you know, airline or anything like that, uh, tourism. Right now they could say, I need a hardship approved. Well, just that little thing, getting that negotiated could keep them from having the IRS wipe out their bank account completely. And maybe they just need time. I have so many clients that just need time. And I can, that's something you have to negotiate. The IRS isn't just going to give it to you. That makes sense. There's so many different facets to tax law. Um, I know, I noticed on your website um, for all your locations, you had Nevada was listed there. And when you click, look over to Nevada, it says cannabis and marijuana tax law. Is there something special about that industry to why you have to indicate that specifically? Yeah, well, I will say, so cannabis uh, has become legalized in so much of the country. And as a former accountant and um, a tax attorney now, I can say both attorneys and accountants are both uh, tend to be conservative in their approach. Attorneys less so, but accountants so conservative. And, you know, they, uh, the number one source of new cases for our firm is, is CPAs, is accountants that don't want to mess with the IRS. They just, they did the tax return. They want someone else to argue, <laughs> do the arguing. And because of that, when cannabis started getting legalized around the country, we started wading into cannabis accounting and being able to help clients because it is still illegal at a federal level, which creates this conundrum. You, you have to report it at a federal level. You also can't have it insured in a bank and you have all these you know, problems that arise and then it has to be separated into these different categories. And then each state is allowing deductions in different ways. And because we knew accountants tend to be very conservative and attorneys also are are not as conservative, but are going to be, most attorneys don't know accounting. That's what I'll say. (laughs) That's probably a more accurate description. We just saw an opportunity there to say, hey, let's get on the forefront of this. We're more aggressive. We know accounting. My business partner was also an accountant before he became an attorney. And so um, we think that it's a great area of practice to help these legitimate legal businesses operate and pay their taxes and know how to stay compliant. I, you know, I, I said at the beginning of this, 
I think it's terrible. The government makes all these rules and then they don't tell people the rules and then you only find out when you get in trouble. I mean, that's happening right now with cannabis. And I hate that. I, one of the reasons I speak so much is because I like educating the public. I, I, I can't tell you how many times people have said, well, why do you just explain all this stuff and then people don't need to hire you? I would rather help people not owe taxes because I, I know business and I know that juggling act, I'm always gonna have clients. I would love to be able to help people know how to stay compliant and tell you what the rules are rather than you I, coming to my conference room crying and telling me that you've been, you're literally sick and feel hopeless uh, because of the mess you're in. Uh, I'm always gonna be there to help those people, but if I can, Help someone know the rules, I'd, I'd love to do that. So cannabis, uh, we specify it for Nevada, but really it's all over the country. It's just we have, happen to have a lot of clients in Nevada and California too, in um, the gosh, Murder Mountain area. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely an emerging industry. I hope sometime it just becomes fairly legal because then you could just blanket cover it and it make it a lot easier on all these different business owners. Well, it's one of those, it's one of those things where you realize, I mean, you just see the politics, like powerful lobbyists and how that whole game is played because it's not, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be like too political on what's in the best <laughs> interest of people, but it is just one of those political it's a game holdups right now. Right. Exactly. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, Rachel, uh, I think you've definitely enlightened me on a lot of different tax laws. You've broken down some myths. It's going to make it a lot easier, especially on the, the industry workers out here who are always under the eye scopic of the IRS. They love to definitely torment the, the strip industry and all the different workers because of all the different facets. So I hope that everyone who listened to this can gain some knowledge and insight and maybe yes. some, some more ease as well. Yes. And I'll tell you, I'll give you one more, uh, maybe piece of knowledge. If you wondered, I used to waitress, that's my extent of my experience in the service industry <laughs> and uh, poorly, I poorly, I spilled tape, you know, whatever trays of drinks on businessmen and <laughs> headline, share great stories. Um, but the one question I get from everybody in every industry is what does the IRS get about me? And they, what they get is the 1099 or W-2 or K-1 that's reported to them. And that number represents whatever the business um, said that they paid to you or what you earned. So like in the service industry, you know, there's usually a tip log that you're recording what your tips are, and it should be at least, you know, a certain percentage of what your total sales were. So what you report on that log is what your business is going to say to the IRS. As far as what does can the IRS get your bank statements themselves? They a hundred percent can. If they if if you don't provide them, they can subpoena them. I will say if they audit you, this is so tying into all of this. If they audit you, the first thing they're going to ask for is all your bank statements, all your credit card statements for the year of the tax return. So if it's a 2020 tax return, they want to see every bank statement and every credit card statement for. Um, that tax return. And now they're, you know, PayPal accounts, Venmo accounts, Cash App accounts, all of that. They're using all of these different um, vehicles where you could be having credit and they count every dollar as income. And so if it's not income, if it's reimbursement or if it's, you know, make sure you're putting notes, like especially with PayPal or especially if you write a check, make sure you're filling out the notes, make sure you know what it's for, that you can record what it's for. Um, and that every dollar you receive, if it's not income, you know why it's not income if you get audited. Makes sense. Uh, wow, I didn't even think of those uh, small nuanced apps like that. They're, yeah. They're, get, they're getting uh, smart. One question, you ever coming out here to Vegas? Oh, all the time. I, um, <laughs> I'm def I have friends in Henderson. I have friends in, uh, gosh, I just had some friends move. I can't think of what, where they moved to. They were in Vegas and they just moved. I don't even I have the address anyway. I should have looked it up. <laughs> um, but yes, I, who doesn't? I, frankly, I 
this whole podcast is for me to have like a million clients and then we can I can be in Vegas all the time. <laughs> yes, everyone has those few crazy Vegas stories. And I always like to call Vegas is like the majority of people's second home and even on like the international level as well. I will say, you know, okay, so, you know, people think of, I think the stereotype is that Vegas is this place where you just go crazy. And I've, I've had really enjoyable, just chill experiences in Vegas. Maybe it's my personality that I've <laughs> just gone bananas, but I mean, I really like it. I just think it's great food and great shows and great music, just so many such a great quality of life great weather all these it's so beautiful the mountains and yeah it's a great place we are a blooming city if i wanted to send all of the listeners and viewers somewhere online to follow you and pulse and tax where would i send them uh well our website's pulsedintax.com you can follow me on linkedin we are on everything we're on instagram post and tax we're on youtube post and tax we're on linkedin post and tax facebook post and tax um uh, we're not on tinder or snapchat <laughs> <laughs> just about anywhere you want to find us look up post and tax all right guys this is the this is the business rachel's the woman that you need to go to to um help ease all of your tax problems. Rachel, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again sometime in the future, maybe when you're out here in Vegas. Yeah, likewise. Thank you so much, Jake. This was so much fun. I appreciate it. Thank you guys for listening and we will catch you next time.